Welcome everybody. Welcome to our lunchtime webinar, a really practical and really useful one today on how to get to yes for your environmental projects. So it's all about the faculty system today. If you've got a project in mind, how can you, how can you best make your case? How can you best engage with the system so that you get a yes for that project and can go ahead and implement it? I always begin my webinars with trailers for upcoming attractions, and we've got two webinars left this year. Uh, the first is on uh, conservation pitfalls and how to avoid them en route to net zero carbon. And the second is on finding the balance, assessing embodied carbon in retrofit projects. I've just realized they're in the wrong order on the slide. That's because we've just run the first topic of the, of the first of those. So that video will be appearing on our website soon. Uh, so the one on assessing embodied carbon, I think should be a really useful one for those of you thinking about the environmental impact of the project itself and, and how you weigh that up against what it might save. Uh, housekeeping. We will, as ever, be using the Q&A for questions rather than the chat. So if you get the Q&A open on your computer, if you've got a question, you can pop it in there. You can also see other people's questions and you can click the thumbs up next to other people's questions and the ones with the most votes go to the top. So when we have a little bit of time of questions towards the end, that's where I'll be looking. Um, as always, after the webinar is finished, I will send everybody the slides and the a link through to our feedback form and also any links that are shared in the chat. Um, it might not be till later in the week because I've got a little bit of time off this week uh, and the recording will make its way onto our website as well. Uh, just to let you know, because most of our webinars are an hour, to let you know this one's an hour and a half, I'm hoping you can stay until the end because I'm sure it'll be really useful if you do. Right, More, most importantly, um, who is your panel here today? Uh, so you've probably come across me already, Catherine Ross, in the Cathedral and Church Buildings team and part of our National Environmental Programme. Um, our panel today is going to be such a, such a useful panel for giving you different perspectives on different parts of the process. So Kerry here is a very experienced case officer in the National Cathedral and Church Buildings Division, so, so one of my colleagues. Um, and she's going to kick us off in a little minute by talking about kind of an overview of the rules and what's A, what's B, what needs full faculty. Then we'll hand over to the Venerable Malcolm Chamberlain, who is uh, a very experienced Archdeacon, and he will give you a few minutes on the Archdeacon's perspective, especially on those List B matters. Then we'll hand over to Lisa McIntyre, the DAC Secretary in Leeds Diocese, and she'll spend a few minutes giving you the, the DAC perspective, especially on things that need full faculty. And then we'll have a few minutes from Nigel Walter, who is himself a church um, architect, conservation architect, but he's also a member of the National Church Buildings Council. And Nigel can give you a perspective on those cases that need to come up uh, to the Church Buildings Council and what it is that the CBC is looking for. Right, I will stop sharing my screen. Um, Kerry, you are going first. So if you're happy to share your screen and get going, that would be brilliant. Absolutely. Oh, that's not the right screen. Worked perfectly last time. How strange. It looked okay from here. How did it? Yeah. All right then. Well, that's fine. Uh, there we go. There we go. Looks good. Perfect. Okay, uh, thank you very much for joining us uh, this lunchtime. I am going to quickly go through the faculty rules, um, the things that you can do with list A and list B and what's going to require a full faculty. Uh, these slides will be available afterwards. There's quite a lot of text on them, so don't worry. You'll have plenty of time to read them later on. Um, so the ecclesiastical exemption. Um, I'm just going to focus on some parts of the ecclesiastical exemption uh, from the order of 2010 and this gives church buildings an exemption from listed building consent and that includes anything within which is listed within the curtilage so the churchyard walls, lich gates, uh, listed memorials, things like that um, and this exemption recognises that church buildings are places of worship and it allows us to balance mission, worship and wider community use with the duty of care and conservation for the listed building. 
uh, we only have the exemption uh, on the condition that we maintain our own equivalent heritage protection system instead of applying for listed building consent. Um, so for churches, that is the faculty system, and for cathedrals, that is the care of cathedrals measure. Um, we're not exempt from everything, so you still have to apply for planning permission, building regulations, and other uh, secular legislation as well, which is still relevant. So the faculty system is divided into three different sections. They are list A, list B, and full faculty. So on list A, uh, everything on list A, you don't have to require uh, apply for formal approval in any way. On list B, you have to ask your archdeacon for permission, and anything which doesn't appear on list A or list B requires a full faculty application from your DAC, which is, stands for Diocesan Advisory Committee. Um, so <laughs> these are lots of things that you can do on list A um, for, towards net zero. I'm just going to focus on a couple of them today. Um, so there are still requirements with list A, such as having uh, um, a suitably qualified professional carry out the works or uh, notifying your insurers. Um, I've put in a link at the end to list A and list B so you can check what the requirements are before you go ahead and do any of these things. Um, so I just wanted to highlight a couple of the things that you can do on list A that you don't have to ask for any permission for that will uh, help you get towards net zero with your church. Um, and the first one, as it's National Maintenance Week, I'm going to really highlight maintenance because this is super important for making sure that your church is in good condition and that um, you are working towards net zero. So things that you can do without applying for any kind of approval, you can repair the gutters and clear them out, um, check any accessible below ground drainage. Um, you can do small scale roof repairs, including the flashings, maybe fixing some slit slates or tiles. You can clear any kind of self seeded plants or creepers going up the walls uh, and any leaf litter, make sure that they're not trapping moisture against the walls of the church um, and check any ventilation bricks or vents are clear so that there's a good airflow. You can uh, repair, adapt um, and your heating system, any gas and water and electrical services and installations. So, for example, you can swap to LED light bulbs without requiring any permission. You can install better heating controls, including things like uh, Wi-Fi enabled nest or hive systems to make sure that your heating is working the best for you. Uh, you can insulate pipes in appropriate materials and spaces, so perhaps in a boiler room or uh, in the ancillary spaces, you could uh, insulate those pipes and you can swap to a renewable energy provider, which uh, makes a huge impact for your, your carbon footprint. You can introduce pew runners or cushions, um, which can help to retain heat while you're sitting down, or you can replace any existing curtains as long as they're not to do with an altar. Um, so if you had for example, a curtain around your door, you could swap it for a thermal uh, curtain, which would help to retain heat better as well. Uh, list B requires approval from your archdeacon and is subject to similar um, things as list A, where you might need a professional. Um, and that's always best, best to consult. Um, so I just want to focus on these through at the end here. So you can um, replace a roof covering like for like on a listed building um, and that will help with your maintenance of your building and uh, retention of heat and prevention of water ingress. You can refurbish facilities in existing uh, refreshment areas. So uh, for example, you could install a low flow tap in your kitchen area. Um, or you can introduce a heating appliance as long as it doesn't form part of the overall heating system. Uh, so, for example, you could have an electric heater or a heated mat uh, in an office or uh, in the main church as long as it didn't impact on any historic materials or fabric. Anything which is not or doesn't appear on list A or list B requires a full faculty. Um, and if you're not sure, then always ask your DAC or your Archdeacon. So uh, anything larger scale, for example, renewing the heating or the lighting system completely. So where you didn't want to just change a bulb, but you wanted to move the light fittings, 
um, that would require a full faculty. If you wanted to do any draft proofing, which would include introducing curtains, uh, any secondary glazing um, or insulation in voids uh, where that might be appropriate. And while in your churchyard, you can move over to sort of meadow grasses and wildflowers without any needing any permission, you would, if you wanted to plant trees or perhaps introduce a community garden, which is a sort of a larger scale project, uh, you would need to uh, apply for permission for that. Um, and in some cases, uh, render might be appropriate to your church. This was quite often removed from um, buildings in the Victorian era, and it might be appropriate to reinstate it. That will be a, a discussion that you would need to have um, with your DAC. Um, and it might be appropriate on some newer extension buildings as well. Um, I have included a list of things at the end here, which I thought you might find helpful, including a link to lists A and B um, and maintenance and um, things on your churchyard and all of our guidance documents as well. And Catherine will circulate that to you later. Thank you very much. I'm going to stop sharing and pass over to Malcolm. Thank you. Thanks, Kerry. That's um, really, really helpful. Um, good to be with you all. Um, my uh, role is just to talk a little bit about LISP-B, but before I do that, I hope I'm not stealing Lisa's material here. Uh, we haven't had an opportunity to compare notes, but I just want to begin um, by highlighting two important principles briefly. Uh, the first is the general duty that's set out in paragraph 35 of the Ecclesiastical Jurisdiction and Care of Churches Measure 2018. Uh, and it states this, a person carrying out functions of care and conservation under this measure or under any other enactment or any rule of law relating to churches must have due regard to the role of a church as a local centre of worship and mission. Care has already uh, referred to that and that's the privilege of faculty jurisdiction which enables uh, archdeacons, the DAC, ultimately chancellors uh, to recommend and approve works to historic buildings that might not otherwise be approved. It's good news in our context because striving to safeguard the integrity of creation and sustain the renew of and sustain and renew the life of the earth is, of course, the Anglican Communion's fifth mark of mission. So it must be a priority in relation to the role of a church as a local centre of worship and mission. The second principle, which I won't go into in any depth, is what's called the Alkmund questions, which kind of govern how chancellors make decisions uh, that affect the fabric of historic buildings. It, it, they originate uh, in a Court of Arches appeal in 2012. And um, there's several questions, five questions that all build on each other, but essentially they ask whether the proposed works, if, impl if implemented, are likely to harm the significance of the church as a building of special architectural or historic interest. And if so, uh, the Chancellor must assess how serious that harm will be and whether the justification given by the church and the resulting likely public benefit is strong enough to outweigh the harm. When you take those principles together, it shows just how important it is for a PCC in making any application under LISB or faculty uh, to consider seriously how important and how necessary uh, the work that they're proposing is. Uh, I won't say any more about what list B can cover because Kerry's already done that. Uh, but Catherine has prompted me with four questions related to my role in looking at list B uh, applications. Firstly, how do I decide on them? Secondly, what questions do I ask myself and why do I ask those questions? Thirdly, what information do I need from a church to make a decision? And fourthly, what can churches do to make the process run smoothly? So briefly, how do I decide on list B matters? Well, firstly, it sounds obvious, but I have to make sure that the proposed works are actually covered by list B. So here's my first tip if you're putting in a list B application. Make sure if you're planning to uh, apply for several works under one application, make sure that all of them are covered by list B. Uh, applications cannot be split. 
So if you're planning, for instance, to include four works within one Lispy application and you're a little bit dubious as to one of those works, don't try and slip it in under the radar. Apply for that work separately, uh, because if you put it in the same application and the Archdeacon deems that it doesn't qualify under Lispy, they will have to reject the whole application, even if the other three would have sailed through. I hope that makes sense. So, so do consider carefully whether the things you're proposing are under Lispy, and as we'll say several times, I think, this afternoon, if in doubt, seek advice before you submit the application. The second point to make here is that whilst Lispy matters are for the Archdeacon to determine, we are also duty bound to consult expertise on the Diocesan Advisory Committee before we make a determination. Indeed, if you're using the online faculty system, which uh, many dioceses now have moved on to, uh, that system won't even allow the archdeacons to issue permission until the DAC have offered their opinion. And that means that whilst LISPI works generally don't cause significant harm to historic fabric, because that would require a faculty, uh, those Alkmund questions still remain in the background for many DAC secretaries and architects. And so a good rationale for the work you're proposing uh, is still advisable. It doesn't need to be as detailed as a statement of need for a full faculty application, but it is still worth considering why the PCC is proposing those works. What questions do I ask myself beyond is it part of list B? Well, I think I'd want to be content that the proposed work is in the interests of the mission of the church, and I'd also want to be satisfied that it's a good solution. Notice boards, I think, are a helpful example here, even if they're not directly related to environmental concerns. The need for a new notice board may be obvious, but if the proposed design is really poor and sends out all the wrong messages missionally, and believe me, we have had a few proposals like that, then I'm just likely to push back on the application. Hopefully, my reason for doing so is not to be awkward or to cause delays, but to try to save the church from wasting their money on something that's not going to do the job or will even be detrimental. And that's the main reason why we need to consult the experts on the DAC. Heating engineers, for example, have a much better idea than I do as to whether a proposed solution is a good solution. And so we want to get that advice. So what information then do you need to submit with your application? Well, you need to provide some plans of what's being proposed. You need to include some drawings if they're appropriate and necessary. It's not usually necessary to employ a professional architect for those, though, uh, but, but you do need to kind of outline what the plan is. Uh, we need to see evidence of the PCC support for the application, so it's not just the applicant trying to push something through against the will of the governance of the church. A, a, a PCC minute from the meeting that agrees the works is important. And where necessary, and LISB uh, stipulates where it's necessary, evidence that the church's insurers are content for the work to go ahead, uh, we need to see that as well. As I've already mentioned, a brief but strong statement of need setting out the rationale for the proposal, particularly if it's a, a larger work that's allowed under LISB, uh, is helpful. For work to trees, we might need to see evidence that the work is included in LISB, which for felling uh, will require an arborist's report because we're only allowed to uh, allow trees to be uh, chopped down uh, if they are diseased, dying or a danger uh, to the public. Otherwise, it needs a faculty. Lighting and heating system applications should also be accompanied with full specs as well. And finally, then, uh, what can churches do uh, to make the process run smoothly? Well, I've already uh, hinted at some of that, but just to reiterate, firstly, some tips then. Firstly, make sure all of the proposed works that you're looking to get permission for are actually included under list B. Secondly, make sure that all the required documents are included with the application or, or uploaded if using the online system. Trying to save time by ignoring that rarely saves time in the long run. Uh, we will need to see them, uh, so do upload them. And again, if you're in doubt as to what's needed, a, a quick phone call or email to your archdeacon or to your DAC secretary uh, will clarify that for you. Thirdly, make sure that you've understood and observed the specific conditions for your list B item. Uh, the link that I think Kerry uh, will provide us with to those lists uh, have a column as to what those conditions are. Uh, and archdeacons are not able to sidestep those conditions uh, and we have to refuse permission if they're not being observed. As an aside, of course, archdeacons can insist on additional conditions uh, if they uh, deem them necessary as well. 
And fourthly, if in any doubt, get in touch with your friendly Archdeacon or your DAC secretary for advice before you submit the application. Doing so will helpfully iron out any potential issues and avoid frustrations all around. And finally, finally, before I uh, hand on to Lisa, um, it is worth saying that the Archdeacon does have authority to refuse a permission and recommend a full faculty application, even if the proposed work is included in list B. Uh, I would hope to have that conversation with the parish before I just simply issued a, a refusal, but there can be good reasons for that. For instance, if the Archdeacon knows that the proposed project is likely to be contentious in the church or in the local community, it may be that a fuller consultation project process uh, will alleviate some of that pastoral fallout and so faculty is the right way to go. So again if you're in any doubt uh, do chat to your archdeacon in advance of the application. I hope that's helpful, uh, really happy to take questions later and I'm going to hand over now to Lisa. Thanks Malcolm um, and I don't think you stepped on my toes much at all there, it was actually helpful that you set out that stuff about the duties uh, in, under the faculty system. Um, so I'm going to talk a bit about what uh, is needed when, uh, application, when proposals are of a nature that require a full faculty application, uh, what the DAC will look for when it comes to consider an application and some of the questions that we'll ask, so what application should what um, paperwork should be submitted by the applicant to kind of preempt the questions that the DAC is going to ask and prevent that kind of backwards and forwards. Um, the overriding considerations of the DAC, apart from what Malcolm's um, already said, is like uh, I've kind of basically thought to summarize it as ensuring that the PCCs get a good end product which suits their needs whilst not creating an irreversible negative impact on the building and its environs, um, so the churchyard and everything around it. Um, that is, like, DACs are, unlike, we're there to kind of help PCCs get things through that are going to be of good benefit. Um, so we do enter into that conversation with PCCs in a way that in the regular planning system, you, you might not get as friendly a response. So we are wanting to work with you to, towards a good solution. And sometimes things, well, always things come over a, a fair, under a fair bit of scrutiny. So being prepared for that scrutiny is a good principle to take. And the scrutiny is there to ensure, and Malcolm referred to this as well, that the proposals are going to work. Because sometimes something that seems on the face of it like it's going to be a good idea if it's executed wrong, if that full detail is not provided, it can go wrong in the end and need rectifying further down the line. So if we're being persistent in asking for more information, it's in your best interest really to make sure that you have all that information, especially in the area of environmental sustainability when new technologies are emerging. Um, it's not tried and tested in some ways that other things are. So having that level of detail is really important. Um, and we're generally of the view that PCC should be ambitious about getting to net zero, of course they should be, but sometimes actually um, modest interventions are the most appropriate for your church, so going in with a massive idea about everything you want to do is not, not always going to get the support of the DAC because sometimes it's much better to a phased approach to things which is just more realistic. Um, the DAC, as I've said, um, wants to support you, so we're not out to say no, and we will rarely say no, flat out no. Uh, what we might do is come back to say, think further, and then come back to us. So the, doc the, the documents that are needed for a full faculty, uh, you'll need a statement of needs. Um, Malcolm's touched on this a bit, and a kind of slimline version you might have a, for a list B, uh, with, uh, for a full faculty, you need to set out some general information about the church and how it's used and for proposals that might affect the environmental sustainability. Um, this kind of information about the pattern of use of the building is really relevant. So if, it is, if it's used once a week or if it's used throughout the week, if it's used by different groups, is all really relevant to knowing how much the energy expenditure of the building is and what kind of scale of intervention is needed and if a big intervention is appropriate or if it should be something smaller. So that is really key. It always is relevant to any faculty application, but really key for environmental sustainability. You might wanna draw in 
um, information from your energy footprinting tool results if you have done that. If you haven't done that, it's a good thing to do. It kind of sets out what fuel source you're on and what energy use pattern, what how much energy the building uses. Um, the statement of needs, the final section of the statement of needs is to justify the proposals um, for any application and in an environmental application as with any, uh, setting out the options that you have considered and why you have rejected the other options and why you've gone for the preferred option is really key, um, especially I think around heating applications because there are so many different options of things to do now and some just aren't, aren't appropriate for a church. So the DAC knowing that you've gone through a set of um, different options is important, not that you just shortcut to one that you think is the be all and end all solution. You'll also need the statement of significance, uh, which has to set out the impact of the proposals on the significance of the building and or significant features in the churchyard, depending what you're doing. And this includes potential impact on burials uh, and archeology span as well. Um, if there's going to be a visual, visual or a physical impact to the proposals, um, be honest about this. Um, the DAC will spot it if you say there's not going to be an impact. So be honest about that and explain why it is needed and what, um, how you have tried to reduce the visual impact and the physical impact as much as possible. I'll come back to the point on visual impact a little bit later on as well, because it might not necessarily be what you think it is. Um, so yeah, so an, so an example, if you're kind of assessing the visual impact is, uh, we had an application in the Leeds DAC for a church that wanted to put, introduce solar panels. And they actually opted to do that on the ground rather than on the roof because they didn't want to um, go into the fabric of the building. And the way that the church was set out was they could put the solar panels on the side of the building that wasn't visible from the road. And actually it was only a narrow strip of land. So no one ever went down there. So actually that visual impact was not very great and it avoided having to put um, panels into the roof. Uh, drawings and specifications need to be submitted. Um, they should be fully detailed by the time it gets to a full faculty application. Um, it needs to be clear both on how the proposals will work on a functional level. So it needs information about the heat output of heat emitters, that kind of stuff, um, and enable the DAC to understand what the visual impact will be. So the appearance of the heat emitters, for example, where the cable runs are going to be and um, kind of reassure the, the DAC that uh, the impact on the fabric is limited as far as is possible, but also feasible, something that's still feasible. Um, for major schemes, the DAC can give preliminary advice as well. So you might want to actually um, request that to, for the DAC to discuss uh, options appraisal, for example, at a DAC meeting. This can be particularly helpful where the technology is more novel and when a PCC has um, gotten that assessment from a consultant. So at the Leeds DAC, we recently did this because the PCC had been working with a specialist consultant to, and they had them out to um, temporarily install a few different types of heat emitters. And they wanted a, a kind of drive from the DAC about what might be appropriate, especially because one of the heat emitters they were proposing was a kind of a pendant heater, which kind of was attached to the beam uh, in the church roof and hung down into the um, into the church. So it was, you'd walk in the church and you'd see it straight away and they wanted to know if that really quite pronounced visual impact would be appropriate for the DAC, if the DAC would be willing to consider that. And that came was an interesting debate in the DAC because some DAC members were actually quite in favour of being quite uh, deliberate and allowing that to be seen and others weren't so much. Um, so at the DAC meeting, we'll ask, is the extent of the installation appropriate? So I've touched on the statement of needs already. So this a small church with low use patterns is probably better to have a more a smaller solution, such as a few heater panels could be appropriate if it's only used for Sunday services. But another church um, that the DAC had quite a lot of a discussion over when an application came forward was a church that was actually open during the week, week and had a significant tourist offering. And they were talking about pew panels um, 
um, the DAC queried that quite extensively because they thought actually if someone's entering the building at any time, they just want a general warm ambience and it's not going to necessarily be appropriate for that. Um, like the DAC will ask if the installation is actually like really tenable, like sometimes I've alluded to this already, like a big scale project isn't actually the best thing to cut straight to. And we've had, um, we granted a faculty, or well, recommended the granting of a faculty uh, not so long ago for a church that was doing a phased approach. So they had a discrete narthex room and they got, a, they got permission to install air pumps for that as a first phase to then gradually move on to seeing how that worked and then potentially going further with the rest of the building. So it enabled them to take it in bite-sized chunks a bit more. Um, we'll look at if the application stacks up as a whole. So um, has the building been looked at holistically? So are you making sure that you're reducing heat loss or have you taken measures already to reduce heat loss before you switch over to a new um, energy source and just kind of keep using energy, but in a slightly greener way, but we'll look if it all stacks up. We'll look if there's likely to be inadvertent knock-on impacts, for example, creating um, uh, roof maintenance issues with the installation of solar panels. Is there actually a way to then access well, what needs to be accessed? Um, is insulation going to create uh, new kind of micro environments for which aren't that good for the building? So we'll look at all that. Uh, we'll look at the visual impact on the historic building, which is why you need the, the statement of significance. We might also ask questions about have you um, taken full advantage of the fact that you're undertaking works at the moment? So if you're doing a lighting proposal, um, are you thinking about how you can enhance the building as well? Not just kind of switching it over to make it all more energy efficient, but really taking advantage of the fact that you're doing works and maybe highlighting some um, key architectural features. And we'll ask who the PCC has taken advice from. We'll expect you to have, uh, hopefully spoken to the DAC's um, specialist uh, consultant on, uh, on the area of work that you're proposing. So DACs will have, they will differ, but have heating advisors, lighting advisors, some have specialist sustainability advisors. So we'll, if you're doing a major project, um, it'll be, we'll hope that you'll have engaged with them early on, have requested advice from them early on. Uh, we will look at that uh, you've got potential that you've engaged with your inspecting architect as well. And for some types of proposals, your inspecting architect will have led and developed all the proposals. Other ones you'll need a specialist contractor for if it's very kind of a specialist area. The inspecting architect will know your building. And even if you're using a specialist contractor for the works, will have wanted your inspecting architect to have seen what the specialist contractor is proposing and know that it works with the building. Um, with specialist contractors, uh, they should have accreditation and ideally experience with historic buildings and public buildings, not just domestic uh, contractors. Um, be wary of consultants promoting a specific product. Um, it's good if you've set out your brief and your statement of needs before you approach them, because then you you can kind of push back if they seem like they're trying to sell you something they'll kind of respond to what your needs are rather than telling you what you need too much um in a couple of words of what the DAC won't necessarily um do so those are the questions we will ask and the way we will look at things and just kind of a couple of myth myth buster uh, comments so the DAC will not necessarily be influenced by the existence of local authority advice and um, planning permission already obtained. So there was a case where um, a church had gotten planning permission for the installation of solar panels on a roof. And the DAC, again, we didn't say no, but we did push back. So we wanted to support that principle, but the paperwork we received, we didn't know if the roof was going to be able to carry the solar panels. We didn't know if it was going to be technically possible. The local authority had given permission on much sketchier material than we would want. Um, so we pushed back on that, but inviting the, DA, the PCC to do more and come back to us. Um, and the DAC will not necessarily reject proposals where new technology is visible. 
um, and quite prominent. I referred to the heat emitters and the pendant heating. Some DAC members thought that was quite exciting as a prospect to be able to see that. And recently, our DAC actually encouraged a PCC to um, be bolder with solar panels and maybe consider ones that were a bit more visible that would make for a kind of easier installation all up. So the DAC might not do what you're, <laughs> what you're expecting them to do, but um, it's all emerging as well. So, um, and we take each, um, each application on a case by case basis. So I think the key things are really to make sure you submit as much um, detail as possible so that the DAC can really understand the proposals, both from a visual uh, point of view, but also a technical point of view um, and come come to us early as well for that pre-application advice if you were like looking at something that's particularly a major proposal um, and just work with us and kind of don't, don't uh, expect. There are certain things that we want you to definitely have but there's not um, set answers in each occasion. So come and discuss with us. Okay, thank you. Uh, thank you, Lisa. Um, so, uh, uh, as um, yeah, at, at the at the top of the session, Catherine said, uh, "I'm um, a part of the Church Buildings Council." So the Church Buildings Council uh, may not be uh, a familiar, may not be a household name for for some of you on the call. Um, Church Buildings Council is a bit like a national DAC. You could think of it in those terms. Um, we deal with casework. Uh, we also deal with the development of policy for the Church of England uh, with respect to buildings. And that it's a fantastic, it's a privilege to be involved with it because it's a it's a very interesting place to see how, how thinking is developing. So we have a, a close relationship with um, DACs and um, uh, sometimes DACs will look to us to um, provide some sort of central guidance or to you know sort of test out ideas perhaps. In terms of the casework that we deal with, um, that comes to us by a number of different routes. Uh, quite often it's the DAC that um, will uh, ask for us to look at a case. It might be uh, the Chancellor, um, where, for example, the Chancellor, who is the ultimate decision maker, uh, in every case, um, might be wanting to sort of test out the advice that he's receiving from the DAC, if that's in contradiction uh, to advice from, from um, other consultees. Um, we sometimes get uh, stuff directly from um, churches or indeed uh, directly from church architects uh, more often than that. So um, cases come to us for a, a number of reasons. Um, as you would expect, uh, we um, have a, a sort of triage process um, and not everything that comes to us is considered by the uh, council as a whole. Um, a little bit like a DAC, the council is um, composed of people volunteering their time across a whole range of disciplines, uh, just as the DAC has a range of disciplines and, and uh, everybody's there on a voluntary basis. Um, and we're supported by, in what we do by um, folk uh, like Kerry and indeed Catherine, um, who, so we, we have officers who um, shoulder the, the, the great majority of the work and you know, without them, we wouldn't be able to do our stuff. Um, so, so there's similarities to a, B, a DAC, but we uh, occupy a different place within the process. But what we have in common with the DACs is that we share a church-specific frame of reference, um, as opposed, for example, to Historic England, who are interested in heritage across the piece, or indeed uh, the um, amenity societies, who, um, uh, generally speaking, will be interested in heritage of a particular age, but not, uh, not just churches. So that's people like uh, the Society for the Protection of Ancient Buildings, uh, the Georgian Group, um, and the Victorian Society, and so on. Um, so work uh, cases come to us, uh, and they either get um, delegated to officers to um, deal with or get considered by um, the council as a whole. But in, in either case, the officers are, uh, are very much involved. It's the officers who will uh, write to you as a parish uh, with uh, uh, in either case. Um, 
And part of the process of um, deciding which sort of bag it goes into, whether uh, to be delegated or not, is to do with the importance of the building. Uh, so we're much more likely to be um, discussing works to grade one, grade two star listed buildings um, than grade two uh, or indeed unlisted buildings. Um, also, there's a question of precedent. So we, we are um, very mindful that uh, the advice that we give may be setting precedents. So, for example, um, uh, th there's a question about sort of uh, the setting of precedents around uh, where it's appropriate to place photovoltaic panels or in, in which situations are photovoltaic panels uh, appropriate for a grade one listed building, for example. So uh, th there's we are concerned with precedent. So the, the more uh, a case uh, breaks new ground, the, the more likely it is to be um, considered by the council as a whole. In terms of what makes um, applications run smoothly, which so you know a, a process, a nitty gritty process question. Um, I suppose I, I would point to two things. Firstly, um, please uh, do your homework. Do your homework and show your workings. It's like maths O level. Um, if you you get you get marks for showing your workings, and even if you get the right answer, you won't get marks if you don't show your workings. It's much much easier to um, get on board with what you're trying to do if we can understand that you've been through a thorough thought process and uh, that you have considered things that it's well reasoned. That, that's I suppose the thing. So that's that's about homework. Um, and the second sort of thing which uh, Lisa uh, was mentioning is um, showing that you are taking a holistic approach to your uh, to, to your building and indeed not it's not just the building it's also the churchyard if, if as in most cases the church sits within a churchyard so there's um, uh, in the case of uh, solar panels um, one might think uh, great solar panels are a great idea uh, let's apply for them, but that's less, much less likely to be successful than the case where you are stitching that into a more holistic uh, approach that thinks about uh, how that energy that you're going to be generating is going to be used. Um, so there's um, homework and there's, uh, there's a holistic approach. Um, just coming back to um, some of what Malcolm was saying, um, the ecclesiastical exemption from listed building consent um, is a fantastic privilege, really, that, that, that the church has. Um, it's and, and part of the impact of it, again, as Malcolm was saying, is that it allows for the church's concerns, the church local and the church national, our concerns with mission to be factored into the weighing up of uh, the benefit of, of a proposal versus how it might impact uh, the significance of the building. You simply would not, not get that because within the secular system, if, if, if our applications were being judged by um, local authorities uh, on their own. So it, it's a fantastic uh, privilege. And, and part of the mission thing is to see um, our historic church buildings as living buildings. So they're, they're buildings that have changed multiple times through the ages. and uh, I would argue as a as a conservation architect and uh, also doing some academic research, I would argue very strongly that we shouldn't now be trying to stop them changing. We should be controlling how they change in a positive sense. We should be shaping that change in a way that adds to their significance. It doesn't detract from their significance. That's that's the key thing. It's not should they change. It's how should we change them so that we change them well. Um, so I suppose we're looking for proposals that um, are aware of the significance that there's a um, um, Lisa mentioned the statement of significance statement of needs. The job of the statement of significance is to demonstrate that you, the parish, have understood your building. And that's really demonstrating that you're a safe pair of hands, you know, that you're not sort of maverick, as it were, who are just kind of kind of going to, going to uh, sort of break up the shop. Um, it, it's showing that you understand what is important about it and that what you are going to change about the building is uh, a worthy addition to that. And inevitably, this 
takes more time than simply deciding what you want to do and going down to B and Q and getting the stuff to do it and then getting up on the roof and you know fiddling about whatever. It's so it's it's a if we are used to doing that sort of process on our houses, for example, you know, kind of weekend DIY, then the process can seem interminable and it can seem you know, very frustrating and it can seem that everybody's sort of against us. That's not the case. Um, it, it is the case, however, that we need to be thoughtful about how we change our buildings. Um, but we have a, a basically a very good system within which to do that, uh, the ecclesiastical exemption. And the um, I suppose I, I would end by just observing that as a parish, you are in a uh, network when you come to try and change your building you're in a network of relationships um, so DAC, CBC, um, all sorts of other peoples and, and particularly the Chancellor who is the key decision point um, and if you approach that network of relationships in a positive frame of mind in listening mode then you are much more likely to get to a good result that doesn't hurt you because the process can seem quite hurtful uh, if approached in the wrong way and fundamentally, the DAC, particularly as your initial point of contact, the DAC are your friends. Um, you know, assume they are your friends. They are your, they, they're your cheerleaders. Um, and you can also access a whole load of um, uh, useful uh, information and help through them. Uh, just one other point in closing, the, um, the chancellors are also, um, they are absolutely sympathetic to what you and the parishes are trying to do particularly with respect to green stuff and indeed the um the uh, faculty jurisdiction the way it is being implemented is changing subtly uh with, with some um, ongoing revisions such that for example um it becomes less easy simply to swap an oil boiler for another oil boiler when the oil boiler is no longer fit for purpose so so the um uh, and equally to encourage people towards uh, greener solutions. So there's some the, the landscape as a whole uh, is changing in as the culture is changing as we wake up finally to needing to address uh, address our carbon footprint. So I've I've gone on long enough. Thank you, Catherine. Thank you all. Thank you for those introductions. I think they're really useful for giving that sense of the of the process and how the different pieces fit together. Um, what I'd like us to do now is just um, flesh out what you said with some specific types of project and see if that adds anything else into the mix. And I thought I would start with, with let's combine lighting and flood lighting together. Um, Lisa, I might look to you first. When you have a good application arrive on your desk for, for lighting or flood lighting, what, what, does a good, what does a good look like for those kind of applications? So I think for a lighting application, um, there is, so with all the improvements in lighting technology, like basically if you're doing a holistic uh, replacement of lighting, you're going to be uh, installing it with uh, units, um, emitters, whatever you want to call them, uh, which are going to expend less energy each on their own. Um, and so, can be, I don't want to say lazy, but what we want to look for is more than just like substituting existing for existing. We want to make sure, because that's going to be, yeah, that you're already doing the improvement, but then can you do more than that? And can you do things like put in smart controls, which enable you to be able to, you know, if you've got a building that's open during the day, like ones that come on with like sensors or ones that can be um, set to time to come on and off as, at appropriate moments rather than being left on all the time, all, all, um, all, all on all the time. So um, that is kind of like really crucial going that extra step further, um, not just replacing um, the same number of, of, of lights and kind of using them in the same way, thinking about how you're going to like use the installation as a whole. Um, another thing I kind of alluded to in what I said earlier was actually, are you, you know, if you're doing this for the environmental sustainability, are you also just looking at chances to enhance the building as a whole um, and kind of thinking about doing that whole like assessment of what is needed in, a, in order to 
make it so that the installation serves your needs um, for reading, for liturgy, like the different areas of the building, um, maybe highlighting, like we had one where a church came in and did a, a whole new scheme and they um, added extra lighting to the war memorial, but like in a way that didn't add, there wasn't like loads of extra light, it was just like a ni nice extra bit of lighting. So looking at that, because the other thing you have to remember is every time you do something, you kind of think about whole energy use you don't want to kind of put in an installation that then isn't like actually fit for purpose like for like your complete needs um further down the line so thinking about do you actually use the, do other groups use your building do you use it for concerts all that kind of stuff making sure that's all done at the same time um thinking about that so that means that it's not just environmental improvements but improvements all up um for lighting installations as well especially if you're doing like a major um Relighting, you can get consultants to come in and uh, you can do test runs as well with lighting. And there are also clever technology like computer technology programs that can you know, kind of project what it's going to look like. But if you can do it, actually getting in the units and checking that they're going to work best because then you know that you can keep the units to like a minimum and energy expenditure for the most benefit as well. So having worked with a specialist lighting consultant for a major scheme, like if you're doing a smaller scheme, you might just want to work with your inspecting architect. But for a major scheme, we would recommend um, engaging like professional lighting consultants as well. So interesting hearing that answer, because I think there's a real sense that the whole system is kind of designed to make people only do like for like because it shouldn't check you know we shouldn't be changing anything but actually what you're saying is if you're going to be doing a project get the most benefits you can from it absolutely <laughs> is there any anyone uh, no you have something to add on lighting um just a couple of general comments not not specifically sort of green related uh, with respect to lighting one um, do make sure that you end up with a system that has comprehensible controls uh, that you know, because the lighting folk can often give you something that's very complicated that they think you want but they haven't really understood what uh, a voluntary community uh, is able to um, sort of deal with and the second thing is again um, thinking of this stuff holistically um, a good lighting scheme needs to uh, explain how uh, cable runs are going to go, you know, exactly where, where did they go? So that, for example, they don't run straight across the medieval wall painting, as has been known. Hmm. Carrie, I think you had your hand up. Uh, yeah, just to kind of reinforce what everybody else is saying, a zone system is really helpful um, because then, you know, you can turn the lights on in the office without having to turn on all the lights in the nave. And similarly, having different settings so that um, perhaps on a, on a bright day, you don't need most of the lights, but there are still a few sections that are quite dark. So you might want to have a separate bit of, you know, not a separate light switch, but separate controls, which can, you can still light up that area without having to turn on all the lights. Um, and yeah, to reiterate what everybody else has said that a whole system um, works really well, think about your whole building and make sure that it really works for what you're trying to achieve. Very good. Uh, I think I'll move on to heating then, particularly we're getting a lot more applications for, for heating and low carbon heating solutions. When an application arrives on your desk for a, for a heating project, what makes for a good application? What do you want to be seeing from a church? Somebody wave at me, who wants to go first? Oh, now I've got three at once. Right, Kerry, we'll go. Kerry, Lisa, Nigel. <laughs> um, I think it's similar to the lighting system. We want to know that you really understand your building and that you understand the way that you use it. So, for example, a church which is used on once, you know, every Sunday morning, uh, an underfloor heating system is, is not an appropriate heating system because that needs to be left on quite a lot of the time to have a, a regular kind of low temperature. Um, but in a building that is used seven days a week, maybe that might be a very good solution, but that's also going to depend on the kind of floor that you have. And if you're going to have to dig up a medieval floor, that's probably not very appropriate. So it's just, it's really important that you understand 
your building and how it works. Again, a zoned approach is really helpful so that you don't have to have all of the heating on all of the time if you're only using one section of the building. Um, what else? Um, there, like Lisa said earlier, there are so many different types of heating system and we want to be really sure that you've gone through all the different options that are available to you and that you've chosen the one that's going to really work for you. So if you have decided on under pew heaters, but you also think you might like to take your pews out in five years time, that's not very good thinking. Um, so yeah, something which is going to work for your building and the way that you use your building. And use it not just now, but in the future from, from yes. what you're saying there. Okay. I think with, um, yeah, Carrie said a lot of it already. I think, so we had an application recently with um, Leeds DAC where someone had set out the options they considered in their statement of needs and um, it wasn't, evident so it sounded good like what they were saying but it wasn't really evident where they'd taken the expert advice from so actually kind of knowing um that they've been speaking to the right people because sometimes uh church will go in knowing what they think is the solution so haven't actually gone to a consultant with a very open mind about all the possibilities so knowing where that advice has come from um, Another thing is we really, really recognize like the funding issues for all of this stuff. Uh, so we get applications where we encourage people, even if they know that they can't afford to do a complete scheme at the moment, that if they could ask them kind of test if they could do like a phased approach. So if there are parts of the building that could be um you know fueled by air source heat pumps or whatever if they could kind of start to transition to do at least some of it like it's not an all or nothing like there can actually be a way to kind of start to move towards a partial solution which is some kind of improvement which is in some cases is all that's affordable and that might actually be like the most appropriate thing so I think that um really kind of honest assessment like having used a professional and also kind of just really looking at all the options, including phased approaches. I just, yeah, we would look for that kind of evidence. Um, I, I suppose one, one sort of general comment um, about heating systems is that uh, you need to think in terms of heat source uh, and heat sources where one gets the uh, ability to reduce one's carbon footprint but that needs to be twinned with heat delivery. So Kerry was talking about underfloor heating. Uh, underfloor heating, I'm a big fan of underfloor heating, but as she says, it's not the right solution in various situations. It all depends, that, that then interfaces with how you use the building. Um, our own church, uh, the church that I belong to um, here in Ely Diocese, um, we are very keen to reduce our carbon footprint. The logical way of doing that is through um, uh, probably air source heat pumps, possibly ground source. I want to have a look at that. But it has a whole series of the, the heat delivery aspect then opens up a whole series of questions about reordering. So um, one can quickly sort of get into a bigger conversation, which in our particular case, I think the church is up for anyway. But um, it's not, it's often not just a case of sort of fiddling with one bit of the system, um, not least because um, one of the aspects of a, um, a, a heat pump, whether ground source or air source, is that the heat that it delivers is lower temperature, lower grade heat, uh, which means lower temperature than you get out of a boiler, um, which means that for the, a given amount of heat into a space, um, you need bigger radiating surfaces if, it, if it's a radiator type system. And then finally, that brings us on to a question of what are we heating anyway? Uh, and uh, in certainly in buildings that are less frequently used, it's much better to think about how we heat the people than how we heat the space. We, we've got used to, um, to having central heating in our houses and we heat all these rooms, uh, which are relatively, you know, generally speaking, relatively sort of limited ceiling heights, uh, relatively well insulated, perhaps. Um, relatively draft proof. None of those are true of a church. So one can, uh, heating, treating a church as if it is your home uh, ends up with, generally speaking, 
inefficient systems and a, a waste of energy and therefore a, a huge carbon footprint. So it's a, another example of the need for holistic thinking. Can I just make a, a brief question? I mean, just listening to um, these expert colleagues, <laughs> it just comes right back down to um, knowing what you need um, and giving really careful thought to what we need. What What is it we need to do? And, and it is about the activities of the church as well as the church building and its specifics. And I think um, at that point, this is why I always say, you know, bring in consultation early on with the experts um, so that you can have those discussions with people who know about heating systems or lighting systems. I just, I, I put my hand up originally, just it's a little bit late for the lighting, but I think it has a bearing with heating. I was in a, a one of our um, kind of uh, major church buildings uh, just this weekend doing a conference and using a, a particular building. And they, a few years ago, put in a wonderful lighting system. I mean, it, it is amazing. It's really versatile. It has lots of different colours. It can use with different seasons and moods, all controlled from an, from an iPad or something equivalent. Um, and um, the reason why I tell the story is because I, I was um, with the person who was trying to get certain lights on, and he was um, uh, kind of tearing his hair out because he was trying to find where uh, the Wi-Fi connection was. <laughs> and uh, there were black spots in the church, and he, he needed to be in a place to see how the lighting was, but couldn't get the Wi-Fi signal at that point. And I think with, with these new solutions with nest systems with heating with uh, you know online systems with lighting there is another consideration to have in there if you're proposing that and that is about the coverage of wi-fi and various others so some of these issues are kind of quite complex um, and that's why i'd always say you know make sure you're having those conversations with with the experts as well um, a couple of your answers there have, have sort of woven into some of the questions in the q a so i'll just touch on those now Kerry, you were mentioning about, you know, if, you, if your church is only used once a week, then underfloor heating is too big an intervention for the small saving you might make. And there's a question about embodied carbon. Uh, do DACs get involved in discussions on the impact of a project on embodied carbon? So, so that's all of the materials that it takes to do the project, as opposed to the saving you might make on your energy bills. Um, Lisa, do DACs worry at all about embodied carbon yet? Or, or is that kind of still work in progress I know nationally we're still trying to think how to how to deal with it it will vary from DAC to DAC I should have said that at the outset everyone's going to look at it differently um there's definitely an awareness of all that um but I think probably it is um not necessarily being like articulated and being that question being asked I think probably in the same way like nationally it raises a much kind of bigger question and my understanding of like the zero carbon measuring is that yeah it was kind of being taken in phases so if people can be looking forward to that and thinking about all that and yeah where they're sourcing their materials from and like because the, then you get kind of ethical questions as well that are kind of all factors into it like what countries materials are coming from and all that um those questions do arise from time to time, definitely. Um, but I don't know, and that's all in the mix, kind of. But I, it will depend. If you're if you're thinking about that stuff, great. <laughs> and if you can get, demonstrate that you are, great. And then there's a question in the in the Q and A from from Liz that I suspect cuts across all the different topics, which is about how to find the right advice, how to find the right people. There are so many experts out there. What would your what would your advice be to a church thinking where do we turn to for good advice? Can I, I'll come in on that because I, I really do believe that um, that a good DAC secretary is the first person in a sense just to sort of approach and um, because they will know who the experts are that are already involved in the DAC process and, and, and the advisory committee in the diocese um, who can advise and uh, those experts uh, that are gathered on the DAC um, are not only experts in their field but they also understand church buildings and and kind of the the requirements of mission and worship and so um, there are all sorts of kind of experts out there <laughs> Um, but not all of them understand kind of historic church buildings or the need of a worshipping community. So, so I really do think that the, the, the early advice, it's why I always recommend in this diocese that when you're planning something, have early conversations with your archdeacon or with the DAC. Just say, these are the sorts of things we're planning. Where, what are the potential pitfalls? Where are we going to run into issues? Um, who do we need to consult um, uh, in terms of getting some advice on the specifics of what we're about? And of course, um, every church has their own um, 
architect as well, their quinquennial um, inspection art architect, uh, who particularly for larger projects will need to be consulted. Um, so, uh, so if you are kind of planning processes, it's, it's always better to bring them into uh, the discussions and the consultations early on as well. Um, I think I might get looking at the questions. I might actually skip a couple and move us on to church grounds now. And Malcolm, I think I'm probably looking at you first on this. There are questions in the Q and A about compost bins, water butts. Somebody uh, at their church they wanted to um, get an old sink and drop that down into the ground to create a little pond. I think it's probably is. And they were told they needed full faculty with those kind of minor works in the church ground give us some guidance what's list a what's list b when would it tip into full faculty yeah i think uh, one, one of the things probably to say firstly is that when when it involves digging down into churchyards um it's not a minor work um and that's particularly the case where we know there are burials but in some churchyards there might be burials that we don't know about that's another issue <laughs> um so so we always need to we always need to be aware of our, uh, watching archaeological briefs and so on and so forth if we're digging down so something might seem like a fairly minor work in a churchyard but it involves going down into the ground um it does it does need to kind of come before um the dac and get advice on that from the archaeological expert on the dac um other areas so um church benches for instance you know uh, were faculty applications and i think they that you know they're very much in list b territory now and and are very easy to get permissions for um and um you know, I think some of the things that people might be looking at, such as water butts or anything, may not be mentioned um, at all uh, in any of the lists. And so technically, if it's not mentioned, we're supposed to say you need a faculty. But I think some of those conversations can be had with the DAC as well. And so, you know, are, are there aspects within within the uh, list B that where this could actually qualify because it's a it's a it's a new concern in some senses. So, again, conversations before you put in an application, I would, I would always say to judges, don't try and squeeze something into list A or list B that isn't there. Uh, but if you think it should be there, have a conversation. Um, what One example that's come fairly recently, which isn't in environment, uh, specific about environment, but with COVID, uh, with more live streaming, um, more and more churches were putting in kind of live streaming material or wanting to put in live streaming cameras and, and, and infrastructure. And that was technically faculty territory, but many uh, chancellors, including our own chancellor, have actually devolved um, that responsibility. So that can now be happen much more quickly because there was a general sort of groundswell saying we need quicker processes for this so uh, there are there are kind of authorities that chancellor can give and delegated authorities so have those conversations it's a bit of a waffle hope that helps <laughs> um, oh, so I, i'll come out and interject um just to add to that because the faculty jurisdiction rules also allow pccs to request um from directions direct from a chancellor if there are matters that don't fall within list a and list b um, and so they can issue on a case by case basis. So if there is something like, um, you know, that you know that you, you're a church that's never had burials or something like that, and there is like a small minor thing that you think might, um, you can't see quite where it fits, you can approach uh, the Chancellor direct and they might be able to give advice direct. Um, there is, yeah, with these things as well, there's sometimes a scale as well. So if you had like one planter box, that, that might be uh, uh, one thing uh, that might be kind of simple to do. Like you might be able to get minor works directions for that or something from the chancellor. But if you start to expand and expand, like we had uh, an inquiry recently in our office where someone just wanted like a compost bin but then they're like oh well we're doing that actually we want this this and this and that and it becomes like a whole landscaping so it's going to kind of really you kind of think about if it's having an impact on character as well like if you're going through a comprehensive scheme even if it's a positive one it can yeah it all just comes together to have a different character impact so that is um something that is yeah does get into the area of faculty um and like when you're talking about like footpaths and all that kind of stuff, it's the chance to look at the permeability of like the surface materials and all that kind of stuff. So a lot of stuff when we're coming through faculty is not meant to be a barrier. It's also kind of an, an opportunity to get like good advice um, about what, what works well as a whole. So is there a, if the church is at that very first step of going, oh, we want to do this, is it A, is it B, is it faculty? And it's not clear in the rules. Is the best thing for them to email their archdeacon? Is that the best kind of first step if you're not clear? 
Yeah, I think so. Um, or the DAC secretary, because um, if the Archdeacon doesn't know, that's where they'll go as well. Um, but but I think yeah, ask ask for advice. That there is a there's a I think Catherine Paul has um, put a question, which is a really good question. Digging down how deep though? What if we're just planting bulbs in the garden? Because I've kind of implied that any sort of digging. Um, there there is a I mean there is a um set. Like, I don't know that's off the top of my head. Lisa, can you remember what the kind of what the depth is where you would always need a watching archaeological brief for? Can you remember? Ooh. I don't know. Is there is there one in legislation? Uh, well, I think there's, 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 there's a few things where um, uh, in list B where mine uh, like new ground disturbance isn't allowed, but the implication is if you know you've buried a cable previously, you know, going along the same route, that's not new ground disturbance. So there there is some allowance within it, but planting bulbs and stuff, and yeah, because you can get a, a a tree planted by archdeacon's permission, and that's obviously ground disturbance. So um that kind of minimal minimal stuff where you can just be respectful um if you do happen to encounter something at surface level but there but it is surprising how shallow the depth is in an ancient churchyard how close burials can come to the surface which is why all that provision is there but it does become a bit um feel a bit ridiculous when you have a Victorian churchyard or something where you know exactly where the burials are or, what you, or even more ridiculous when you know there are no burials in the churchyard so that is one where kind of getting in touch with the DAC or archdeacon and they might then direct you on to the chancellor for uh, directions is just the best advice. Um, I'm going to move on to solar panels now because I know that that's an area of real interest um, and Kerry I think I'll go to you first because I know we've recently been working on the new guidance together. Um, what does a good application look like for a solar panel installation? So solar panels are a wonderful way to use renewable energy to power your lights, maybe your heating system, all sorts of things. And we want to encourage um, suitable applications. So solar panels should really be kind of the last thing that you're looking at after you have considered everything else that doesn't mean that you have to do everything else but you have to have thought about all the other possible things that you could do to get your building to a, a really good place in terms of net zero so for example you have made sure that your building is in really good condition you don't have lots of holes in the roof um, and you know lots of broken windows that are going to leak out any heat that you put into the building um, so once you've sort of looked at that and you need to consider the building as a as a whole and what you're trying to achieve um, and then you might want to start looking at solar panels if that's appropriate um, it's going to depend on where you're able to put them so Lisa mentioned that you might be able to put them in the grounds um, you'll need um, an appropriate roof slope if you're going to put them on the roof. Um, there are certain pitch uh, requirements that you need, so it, it can't be too steep. Um, a flat roof might be really appropriate, but it depends uh, how much weight that flat roof can bear. Um, so you'll need to understand the, the structure of the building as well. Um, you want to make sure that the roof underneath is in good condition so if it's going to need replacing quite soon it's a really good time to replace the roof roofing material and put the solar panels on top and then that'll um will be in in good nick because if the roof covering is going to need replacing in 10 years um that's not a very good way to um to sort that out so you wouldn't want to put solar panels on top of a roof that's going to need replacing before the solar panels need replacing um what else you still you need to look at uh, the cable runs and where they're going to go and um you need to make sure that solar panels are are a good option for you because if you can't do battery storage then you need to be able to use the energy as it's produced so are you using a lot of electricity during the day in the summer when there's lots of light available and it's creating generating lots of electricity for you um, if your church building isn't open during the week and in daylight hours and you can't afford to install a battery pack, then it's probably not the best solution for you. And there might be something else that's more appropriate. 
think if I can jump in, um, I, one I mean, one question is what sort of building have you got? You know, if, if you've got a, an unlisted building that is, you know, kind of it's got a nice south facing roof and no, you know, kind of no major tree shading. That's one thing if it's a uh, if it's grade one listed uh, building in a prominent location, that might be a bit different. Um, I suppose I would come back to a, um, a sort of comment I made earlier, I think, uh, that we're in a time of cultural change and particularly with respect to um, what is what it's appropriate for us to do in moving towards uh, carbon neutrality with our historic buildings. That, that's a really sort of big and interesting discussion. And I personally, my, you know, th this is personal view rather than um, CBC policy, but my personal view is that we should be pushing quite hard to um, find uh, places where we can uh, find um, listed church buildings where we can sensibly put uh, photovoltaic panels absolutely taking Kerry's point that it needs to mix well with you know the rest of what's being proposed uh, that's a given um, one of the major things and, and one of the realities of of installing photovoltaic panels is that we not only need uh, faculty we also need planning and uh, so the success or failure of uh, a proposal for that will um, in part depend upon the local authorities approach and within the local authority um, how progressive or um, preservative if you want to put it that way is the conservation officer um, and uh, so it, uh, what that feeds into is a is a is a very rough current rule of thumb which is that if you've got a um, let's say you've got a grade one medieval uh, parish church if you've got parapets around your roof and you basically can't see that roof from many places or any places, then you're much more likely to be able to get permission um, than if it's, you know, without a parapet and a bit steeper and, you know, it, presenting to, to the world. Um, and, and, you know, that is you know, absolutely fair enough. The last bit that I would add to that is that I suspect in this process of cultural change that we're undergoing, I suspect that we will the, the 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 dividing line between what's acceptable and what's not will move, and part of the reason it will move is with churches arguing that, um, as Malcolm touched on at, at the outset, that this is part of our mission. You know, the fifth mark of mission: care for creation. And photovoltaic panels, by the very fact that they are visible, make a statement about the church's concern for creation. Um, and that, in conservation terms, feeds into uh, a discussion of you know, how much we trust uh, the core community that looks after the building to have an idea of what's good for it. A, a lot of the conservation process, not within DACs particularly, not within the CBC, but within the conservation process at large, basically assumes that uh, local people are idiots and you have to trust the experts. Um, and I would argue strongly that while uh, local people are capable of doing significant damage to a listed building. They are also experts in what it is to operate that building in that locality. Um, and that should be respected alongside the other forms of expertise uh, that have a say within the system. I, can I just jump in briefly on that one, Catherine, just for an example. We, 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 um, we uh, had a church which was applying for um, solar panels um, in a kind of um, urban village community, quite a traditional community, um, uh, went through the DAC process and, and we, we were happy to recommend, but in the, uh, they ran parallel process with the council and the council denied planning permission. Um, and our sense probably there is that the local community or members of the local community uh, said, this is our historic church building, we don't want big panels on the roof. Um, and that the council in a sense um, caved a little, I know this has been recorded, I have to be careful, <laughs> caved a little too easily. Um, so it just indicated to us also that, um, that actually communication with your local community as to why you're proposing to do something that will potentially change the sight lines and what things look like is absolutely crucial. I think um, uh, this is not a criticism, you know, but the church may have been able to communicate that plan um, uh, over a longer period and better with the community. Um, uh, and, and it may have kind of um, led to a, a different decision uh, and to different 
kind of uh, response responses to the planning process. So um, that that's really important, I think, as well. Definitely. I, the community point uh, is interesting because I went on a site visit recently where an unlisted church is considering solar panels and uh, with also with reordering uh, to increase the community use because they basically got into a point where they had almost no one in the local community, like attending church in the local community. The congregation had reduced dramatically, but actually during COVID, they set up like a WhatsApp community group and now restrictions have eased. They did that because everyone was locked down. Now restrictions have eased, the community groups want somewhere to come together. And actually they want, one of the desires of the PCC is to enable people to use that building at really low cost. And so actually, if they're generating their own solar power, it kind of means that the kind of overall reduction, they won't have to charge for hiring out and stuff because their costs will be reduced. So actually, that I mean, that is an unlisted building. Um, but that actually engaging with the community might add to your argument. If you can say actually more people are going to be in this building, we do really need to find a way to make it sustainable and kind of cut our energy emissions. That's all could add to your argument and be really crucial. I'm going to link us now. There's a really interesting question that builds on what we, that discussion about solar panels from Aidan that says, any thoughts on balancing the benefits of sustainability against the value of a heritage asset? Um, it's valuing apples and oranges to a certain extent, but would appreciate your thoughts on how it can be objectively analyzed. So that process of weighing up harm and benefit, can you, can you give us a little bit of insight into how that actually works at the DAC, at the, at the CBC? How, does, how, do you, how do you make that calculation when you're weighing up such different things against each other? I guess I suspect the answer is a matter of judgment over a long period of time. Nigel. I suppose I suppose it's it's a comment rather than a comprehensive answer. Um, it, it the question begs another question, which is um, what is the significance of this listed building? And I would say that the significance of uh, any listed building is not only the fabric of the building, what it looks like, etc. Nor is it, as some people might argue. Is it only about the people associated with the building, the community? It's it's the nexus, the binding together of those two things. So the to me, the the it comes back to the, the previous question about um, arguing for change. If if we can demonstrate that we've got a community that is really keen on the proposal, and particularly if if it is the case in the context of using the building better. That's a really powerful argument in favor of change of, of whatever type, whether, whether sustainability or otherwise. So there's a question about where does, the, where does the meaning and the importance of the thing come from? And, that, and different people in the process will see that differently, bluntly. So just to bring you back to something I just touched on right at the, in my presentation, the, the outcome and questions which the chancellors will, um, in a sense, be bound by in terms of um, their consideration. Uh, if, if, if they've reached an answer that, yes, there would be serious harm to historic fabric, um, that their next two questions are, firstly, how clear and convincing is the justification for carrying out the proposals? So that's where the statement of need is really important. And a very strong, robust statement of need will, will help the chancellor to say, well, OK, Okay, this seems to be a good justification. And then uh, bearing in mind, I'll, I'll read the, the, the full paragraph, bearing in mind that there is a strong presumption against proposals which will adversely affect the special character of a listed building. Will any resulting public benefit, including matters such as liturgical freedom, pastoral well-being, opportunities for mission, putting the church to viable uses that are consistent with its role as a place of mission and worship, will they outweigh the harm? So, um, so again, you know, environmental concerns are absolutely a part of the mission of the church, you know, safeguarding the integrity of creation. And so if that's part of the statement of needs, very strongly articulated, um, then it can help a chancellor with the DAC's support to reach a decision that says, yes, there is harm, but actually the missional benefits of, of, of the proposal uh, outweigh that harm. So it, it is a balance act in the end, um, but I think our statement of needs becomes absolutely critical in that. Okay. Um, yeah, I think balance is, is the most important thing to, to take away from this. And 
to really understand your building. So if you have, um, for example, a building which is listed because it has this spectacular roof, which you can see for miles and miles around, um, and it has, well, I don't know, some beautiful design on it or something like that, it's unlikely that you're going to be allowed to put solar panels on it. If you're looking at um, an extension uh, building, which was you know, done much later and doesn't contribute particularly to the significance of the building, if you're looking at, um, and also just because it's significant doesn't mean that it's not allowed. So it, it really is, you have to show that you fully understand the significance of your building, what is important about it, um, and how what you're proposing will impact that significance. So um, if you think about how long a solar panel is going to last, it's probably roughly 30 years it's, is its useful life. Um, and if you can install that solar panel so that it doesn't impact adversely your roof and the roof structure, which we would ask for anyway in an application, then it's reversible. And actually you're not doing any harm to the physical fabric of the building by installing solar panels. So it's the visual impact. So can you see them? If you can see them, is that harmful? Does it, is it a bad thing that you can see those solar panels or does that contribute to the mission of the church? Um, so it is all, all about balance and about fully understanding your building and how your proposals will impact your building. And ju just just a, a rider to Kerry's comment, um, it, it sometimes comes as a surprise to churches, but um, people won't always agree within this complex network of relationships. You will get different views, different heritage experts, etc., uh, will say different things. And the, the so don't be deterred necessarily if you get a, a negative response. If if everybody is has got concerns, then that might be different. But it, it's ultimately it's down to you to argue your case um, and you know to have the courage of your convictions based on what you see your calling to be in that place I, I would suggest. I would add to that that you might be surprised um, about the opinions of some conservation bodies. So pleasantly yeah. surprised yes. Yeah don't necessarily yeah. be deterred um, mm. if you think that you have a really good argument for what you're trying to do. Now we're we're sneaking up on half past one. So I've got one last question for all of you and then I'll bring it to a close, which is if you had, if you had one piece of advice for a, for a church that's listening in and they're, they're thinking, how can I get, how can I get through this process and, and get a yes for this fabulous project that I'm working on? Um, what's your kind of one piece of advice for, for all the churches listening? Uh, start with you, Kerry. Know your building, fully understand your building. What is it made of? Why is it special? That's not necessarily just down to the listing description. You know so much about that building because you work with it all the time. You know how it works. Um, understand what it's used for, how it's used, um, and tell people. Tell in your application. Explain what, yeah, explain your building to people. Malcolm? Um, consult early. Seek advice uh, in the early stages rather than just after you've put together all the plans and paid lots of money on them. And um, see your Archdeacon and DAC as friends in the process. Um, so the advice they give is not to try and stall what you're doing or to be awkward. It's actually friends to help you achieve what you really want to achieve. Thank you. Lisa? I think mine is to uh, make good use of all the um, advice and resources that are, are out there, like the CBC has been producing a lot, um, our, our um, diocese has guidance. Um, try and familiarise yourself with that, make good use of that, but then uh, I think it's come across quite strongly that each, uh, each, each application is a case-by-case -case basis, and actually you shouldn't make assumptions. You might think that so-and-so down the street or like the next, next parish along did this and kind of assume that you'll get this answer or that answer, but don't assume, just come to the DAC um, because they'll, and their specialist advisors in particular um, will be able to help you think about your, your building with that expertise. So make use of the guidance, but don't try and be the expert. Do come to the DAC for advice. Last but not least, Nigel. Um, I suppose I would say be not dismayed, uh, you know, be encouraged. Um, 
as a across the piece you know um, across all sort of applications for change to uh, listed buildings particularly which are the more difficult ones generally speaking you will be able to do what you want to do provided you argue the case well and arguing the case well uh, means two things i suppose it means showing your workings and it means being in constantly being in listening mode and you may find that you end up doing something different from what you first imagined but the point of the process is to refine what we imagine into something that's more appropriate so be not dismayed what a positive note to end on thank you uh, thank you all so much for volunteering your time and your your wisdom here today i'm sure that everyone listening has has found it really valuable um, and the the recording of this session will go on our website so that it can benefit other people that that weren't here today uh care if you can let me have your slides then i'll send those around to everyone who's joined today along with the links from the chat um, and to all of you that have joined today thank you for joining and i hope that you found it useful and i hope it'll help you shape even better projects back at your churches thank you all for joining us and goodbye <laughs>